I believe that Pastor Barry Sutton is such a one. If you would please stand with me right now. We are so honored, so thrilled that God has brought this man. Now, come on, church. Are we going to give this man of God the liberty to preach how God has told him to preach to us? What do you say we turn him loose in our life to let him speak as the oracle of God? If you're going to get with this man of God and you're going to give him the permission to speak into your life, I want you to lift your hands high. I want you to lift your voice and let's give God a high praise. As Pastor Barry Sutton from Birmingham, Alabama comes to minister. God bless you, brother. Somebody lift up high praise unto God. He's no God for low praise. He's a God for high praise. Hallelujah. Hey, what a mighty God. And worthy and worthy and worthy. Come on, if he's been good to you, you praise him. If you're thankful, you praise him. If you like what he's doing in your life, you praise him. If he's healed your body, you praise him. If you're glad for the Holy Ghost today, you praise him. If you know who he is, you praise him. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, he's a mighty God. I don't care what anybody says. He's a mighty God. I don't care what anybody says. He's a good God. I don't care what your neighbor says. He's still healing God. It doesn't matter what the denominations say. He's a God of miracles. Yes, He is. Praise God. Now, I've already gone and done it. My wife always to me, tells me, don't run around, jump around. Just teach. Give them substance. But I can't help it. It feels so good in here. And God is so good. Brother Holmes was preaching last night. And he got to talking about how good God was and how blessed he was. Are you blessed? Are you? Do you know how blessed you are? Hallelujah. You got to keep your head up. He's the lifter up of your head. You got to keep your head up. You got to keep looking at those things. You start looking down or behind or around, you get in trouble. But oh, I'm a blessed. Touch somebody by you. <laughs> Tell them I'm so blessed, it's pitiful. It's pitiful. Praise God. Brother, sister, elder, we appreciate you, honor you today. Wonderful work in this city. Great testimony among God's people. Appreciate this conference and all the good work, the, the food and the hospitality last night and everything from the room and the baskets and all of that good stuff. And, uh, and just all these young men and ladies that are rush, rushing around and helping and serving and they're doing such a great job. That stuff ju doesn't just fall off a cabbage truck. There's somebody behind that thinking and doing. It's so good to see Brother Hoffer, and we appreciate the media team and all you guys back there. I'm your friend. But Brother Hoffer multiplies everything that we do. We have a gathering like this, and there are people from coast to coast listening to this and being touched by this. and The potential just spirals out. It's amazing. What a great, great ministry. And you're one of my problems this morning. Brother Kurt and his merry band of musicians. Brother Kurt it does such a, he's such a phenomenal minister. Does such a wonderful job. He creates waves. And I, just don't make me qualify everything. But you do, you create it and I get to ride on the wave of it. And when you stop, I don't want you to stop. I want it to just keep going. I could just lay down in the floor here and let that go on for hours. I'm serious. You are such a blessing to us. You really, really are. Appreciate that so much. All the preachers here got good friends here and, uh, and the people of God. I, I can tell you when Brother Holmes was preaching last night, and I appreciate the word in the house last night, Elder. I do. I'm so glad they let me in. 
I'm so glad that they let me in. I wasn't like them. Brother Booker was taking me on a tour, accidental tour of the city last night. And he was talking where this happened and that happened and who lived here. And, and it always takes me back. When I walked in the door, I had hair. But I had lots of hair. Big old shaggy beard. And Now, we were functional. We were all in school and working and functional, good citizens. Well, somewhat. I had some memories. Monday night, I came into Denver. I was walking down the, the hall at the Double Tree. And you could just about contact right there just walking down the hall. Now, some of you homegrowns don't know what that means, but it means the smoke is so thick in there. You could get stoned just walking through the... And I thought, oh, it's legal here. In the middle of the night, I woke up smelling smoke. But it was that kind of smoke. My neighbors were still partying at 2 in the morning. But when we came in, the fire was on. The word was still being preached. Somebody was standing for the things of God. And the generational transfer of the kingdom of God was going on just like it is purposed by God. And that it will always be. If somebody drops the mantle, someone will always be there to pick it up. I'm so glad the door was open and the lights were on. And someone was kind to me and told me how to get the Holy Ghost and how to live for God. Are you glad to be a part of the church of the living God? Praise God. So today we're going to be talking about building. And let me preface it by saying I understand the necessity for Isaiah 40 and tearing down the high places and building up the low places. I understand the construction terminology of tearing down and that's, that's necessary. But you can't live there. You can't live in the land of tearing down. Now, I know we tear down strongholds, but those strongholds are between your ears. They're not in your neighbor's life. They're not in the church across the street. They're not in some political entity or something like that. If you get caught, there's a spirit of tearing down. And I'm not going to spend any time on that today, but I want to tell you God's kingdom is about building, building up. Edify, 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 edify. So, all right, let's, let's read Hebrews chapter 3 and beginning in verse 1. Thank God for all the goodness and the mercies in my life. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful unto him who appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. But this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that hath built all things is God. And Moses was verily faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Moses was living in that shadow land Brother Holmes was talking about, but there are some things coming after that were indicated by the shadowing. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. If you love his word as you're seated today, let's give him praise and let's magnify him. Somebody give him high praise for his word that is forever settled in the heavens. We magnify you, O oh God. We bless your name, O oh God. Thank you for the privilege to handle your word in this house today. Praise God. Clap your hands till they hurt a little bit. Lift your voice till you stretch something a little bit. Hey, we give you praise, oh God. Praise God. So, okay, you can be seated. I see you're, it's a cultural thing. You may be seated. I'm not going to tell you that again. You stand all you want. You dance. You do what you want to do. This is a free country. And we are free in God. So, okay. Uh, 
addressing the church. First, in this, in this passage, there's this overt reference to the, uh, to the deity of Jesus Christ. There's this compare-contrast that is established between Jesus and Moses, or specifically Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus, and Moses. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful unto him that appointed him, as Moses was faithful in all his house. And so we have this compare-contrast between Jesus and and Moses. For this man, Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. It's like John saying, he is, he's worthy. He's preferred before me because he was before me. And leaves us a little bit challenged there because we know John's six months older than Jesus, but he's talking about the old, old, uh, the one that came before, the mighty God, the creator God that's come to earth in the form of a man. And he said, he's always been, he was before me. And here the same implication, who was faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. He, Jesus Christ has more honor, more glory than Moses. And uh, uh, he, because Moses is building a house, but he is the builder of the house. So Jesus Christ is the builder. And here we begin to hear in this compare contrast the fact that Moses is building a house for God, but Moses is the house. Moses is working a project for God, but Moses is the project for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses inasmuch as he who had builded the house hath more honor than the house Jesus builded the house Moses was the house for every house is builded by some man speaking of Moses activity in building the tabernacle but he who had built all things is God. Again, the compare, contrast. Moses is here down on this existential plane. He's building something that is God's something, and it's a process by which men can come to God, and Moses is the builder of it, but he's building it according to the pattern, the temple, the template that he saw in the heavens, and so he is building, but he's building what God has already built in the heavenlies, and he's bringing it down to the earth. He's building an example of it down on the earth. God said, you be careful. You make sure you build it just like I showed you. You're the builder, but I'm the ultimate master builder. You're the project. The thing you're building is the project, but I'm the project manager. Moses was verily faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. And so all of these things are implicating things to come after. They are types. They are shadows. Moses is handling something that's preaching to us about what's going to come downstream. But Christ, the compare and contrast continues, as a son over his own house. Moses is building, but he's building a tabernacle, a house that belongs to God. Moses is the project. He is the house, but his house belongs to God. But Jesus Christ was a son over his own house. He has ownership of the house. Moses doesn't own the house. God owns the house. Moses doesn't own the house of his body. That's God's house. Moses doesn't own the house of the tabernacle. That is God's house but Christ comparing and contrasting again as a son over his own house whose house now we're downstream whose house are we so now we're standing tethered together with this passage with Moses and his he is the project and now we are the project and Moses is and builds the house of God and now we are the house of God if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. So first in this passage, the first thing that leaps out is this overt reference to the deity of Jesus Christ. He is the creator God come to earth in the form of man. Anything other than that, anything other than the oneness, oneness of God requires a, a conspiracy of ignorance. 
blissful ignorance, like the emperor's new clothes or something like that. And anybody that believes in two gods or three gods or any polytheistic type of manifestation, they are willingly ignorant of what the word of God has. You can't find a more dominant theme in the word of God than God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, he is one. And God was manifest in the flesh. So, so not to spend any time on that at all, but uh, we, we're going to explore today the compare, the, the contrasting uh, discussion here. So Moses, like the tabernacle, was the project. And we are like Moses in this passage. And so we are the tabernacle. We are the project. Likewise, we are building the project and so we're working on it and we are it for this man jesus was counted worthy of more glory than moses inasmuch as he who had builded the house hath more honor than the house god was the builder moses was the house now we know we understand except the lord builds the house they labor in vain that build it but god always gives man a place to participate in his plan and in his process. God put Adam in the garden and the garden was God's doing. But Adam has a job in that garden. And by the way, Adam blew that. Adam didn't do that. I read in the Psalms, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I walked out early this morning. Isn't this a gorgeous day? Beautiful day. Wonderful day. And I look at it and I think, look at God. Look at what God does. I, I, I know there's problems and I know there's trouble. But I keep looking up at what God is doing. And I think this is the day the Lord has made. And then I will. God has given us the template. God has given us this measure of time and this space of existence. And in it now, he has allowed us to range free and to exist in free moral agency and free will. And here the psalmist says, I will. Now, there are people doing all kinds of things today. I was behind a lady at the counter at the, at the uh, hotel, and she was already asking what time a bar was opening. And I'm here thinking, I'm going to church. I've been to a bar. I've had my head lay on the bar before. I, I know what that's all about. But thank God we get to go to the house of God. This is a day the Lord has made. I will. The question is, what will you do with the day that God has given you? What will you do with the opportunity that God has given you? What will you do with the life that God has given you? I will rejoice and be glad in it so god creates the constructs and god places man within his constructs and his process and we by will decide how we will participate and to what degree we will actualize what god has made available that that is a launching place for a discussion of praise and worship but we're not doing that today praise and worship is by will it's not by God taking you and shaking you around and moving you around. You praise God by will and by volition. You clap your hands. You lift your voice. You shout. You dance when you're ready to because God is always worthy. And he also says, I will be glad in it. Give your neighbor a great big smile. Oh, that's pretty scary for some of you. But glad then, just like worship, is a function of will and choice. So this is prefaced with a construct. Psalms 118.22. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. The world never likes God's plan. The world never likes God's process. The world never likes the choice that God gives. But the stone that God puts in place, it'll always wind up at the head of the corner. It's always going to be the dominant theme. Don't ever look around at the constructs of man and think they are bigger or better or badder or richer or of more value than the things that God has placed in your life you just need to hang on to what God has done because the stone that God has placed here it is the head of the corner and he says it is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous 
in our eyes. I like what God's. Do you like what God's doing? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our. So we don't complain about the weather. We don't complain about people. We don't complain about what's current event. We just say this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. There is no room. I heard the preacher talk about murmuring last night. There is no room in an overcomer's life for murmuring. That is not the kingdom culture of God. That's the kingdom culture of hell. If you're a murmurer or a griper or a complainer, you need to get filled up with the Holy Ghost. I said you need to really receive the Holy Ghost because it. if you got it, it didn't take. Praise God. Well, you don't know what he did, and you know what they said, and you know none of that is relevant. We got bigger fish to fry. We got a kingdom to launch in the earth. There's people that need the Holy Ghost. There's a, there's God's plan, and I'm gonna make a decision. God drops me in His garden. God drops me in His day. God drops me in this little sliver of life that I have. I've got a decision to make. I'm gonna fool around with all these alternatives and distractions and all of these things that are gonna sap the strength right out of me or I'm gonna focus on the things of God and get as much as I can get done in my little short span allotted life. Well, praise God. So Moses is the builder of God's chosen house. He's building God's house. He's not building his own house. And he's faithful in all of his house as a servant. And he's indicating those things that will come after. Moses built the building. Moses was the building. Moses is building God's house. Moses is God's house. He's the project. He's the project manager. The house that Moses built was God's house. God is the architect. He's the engineer. He's the design artist. He's, he's the all in all. He's the physicist. He's the chemist. He's, he's the one that created all the math that holds it all together. There's a heavenly blueprint for everything. But it takes a man, a woman, a man in the generic sense, on the deck to pull it down out of the invisible, actualize it in the existential to make it real in the earth. So all of this is very prophetic. Moses is a servant for a testimony of those things which are to be spoken after. That's our time. That's us. That's this meeting today on this Thursday morning. And all these things that Moses did were prophetic. And they were informative. I love the study of the tabernacle plan. I take people to the gospel in the tabernacle plan. I jump, and in the Bible study, I jump right out of the tabernacle plan and into the New Testament. Because there's no need in talking about anything else because we're there. They're instructive. They are prophetic. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. Everybody say whose house we are. He said, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. So today, individually, you as a man, you as a woman, you are the house of God. Collectively, we as the church of the living God, we are the house of God. If we remain within the parameters of his design, we are God's building. 1 Corinthians 3 and 9. For we are laborers together with God. We're working with God. It's God's business. It's God's plan. But here we are. He lets us work from the garden all the way to 2017. We are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are what God has planted. You are God's cultivated field. And here you are God's building. The Bible doesn't mind mixing metaphors. I know it's not good liter- literature, but it's, it's how God talks. So God says you are his vineyard and you are his building. Everybody say, I am God's building. And say, I am building God's building. According to the grace, which is not just the unmerited favor of God, it is the anointing of God. According to the anointing, the empowerment of God, which is given to me. And let me tell you, God has given you already everything that pertains to life and godliness. God has already given you everything you need. Somebody sitting here today thinking, if I just had this or that would happen, if I had that. I'm telling you right now, you have everything that you need. You're listening to the wrong voice. You've got everything you need to do what God has told you to do don't wait another day 
Say yes to God. To the empowerment of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder. So Paul said, I'm a master builder. I have laid the foundation. And another buildeth thereon. And so this is a generational thing. This transfers from generation to generation. These are themes we recognize and themes we are familiar with. And and so you may build, but you won't ever finish because there is no end to the increase of his government and his peace. Everybody say amen. Say it with me. There is no end to the increase of his government and his peace. So what God is doing, it doesn't stop. The best days are not over. The best days are continuing. God is always building. God's always growing. There's, I don't care how old you are. I don't care what happened in the past. I don't care about who failed what. None of that matters. God's kingdom today is burgeoning. God's kingdom today is ready. God's kingdom today is explosive. God's kingdom today is pressing the boundaries. God's kingdom today is just waiting on a man or a woman to say yes to God. Oh, clap your hands just a little bit and shout to God. So we lay the foundation. You may not live long enough to build everything you thought you would build. You may have the vision, but it takes generations to build this thing, and it's going to go on until he comes. It doesn't stop when you die. God's about to kill Moses. He takes him to the, to the mountaintop and shows him new vision and then kills him. So, And later on at the Mount of Transfiguration, he gets to stand in it. He said, there it is, Mo." But you're not going. So you may see things that in your lifespan you may not walk in. But you'll be among those that stand at the banister of heaven, compassing us round about with such a great cloud of witnesses. I believe they watch. I believe they see. I believe they interact. Now I'm chasing rabbits. But that guy that was Paul's, that was John's tour guide in the book of Revelation, he said, no, no, don't worship me. I'm just one of your brothers. I just got the job to lead you around and show you all this miraculous stuff. Ain't it great? But he had already died and gone on. Oh, well. Chasing rabbits. I laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. You are the building. You are the project. And you are building the project of God. And the blueprint is in the heavens, in the ethereal, in the invisible. It is God's blueprint. And we are all building. We are all called to build. It's not just the preacher that builds. It's the house of God that builds. Everybody builds. Everybody's got a calling. Everybody's got a ministry. Everybody called to build their own but as you're building remember this for other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid which is Jesus Christ you can build but you got to build it in God's terms and that's that's the only choice so Paul says the church is the building Paul builds men and women he builds process we are collectively the building of God so we are God's house but Christ is a son over his own house whose house we are everyone say whose house we are he sets a template there of sons over their own house and we follow that template we follow that indication within the parameters of God's we're not like we're not like slaves and servants you, you, you can get up out of the pig pen and go home, but you can't be a servant. You're, you're a son, and you'll never lose that distinction. And you've got to get up and take on the authority and come back into the Father's house and be called to be what God has called you to be. As Moses, we build up the house. We build up our house. Now, you can't build some new thing that God hasn't designed. This is, and this is not some amorphous, abstract thing without parameters and without boundaries. The house of God has specific boundaries. The house of God has a specific blueprint. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. 
The chief cornerstone determines, identifies, validates, informs as to everything else. There's all, I, I'm from the Bible Belt. I'm down in Birmingham, Alabama. You can't throw a rock without hitting a church. They're everywhere. And every third person I meet in Birmingham is a prophet. I know that because they tell me that. It's like, well, uh, so, but you can't just build something that's not what God has called you to build. The, the cornerstone or our creator God, the master project designer, shows us the parameters. And the cornerstone determines ownership. Now, you can build a church, but whether or not it's God's church is dependent upon whether or not it's on the cornerstone. You can build a Baptist church, a Methodist church, Catholic church. My word, I've walked in St. Peter's, and I mean, there's more value in the first five feet than uh, Pentecost has to spend today in, in terms of uh, physical uh, material wealth. But that ain't the church. It's not the church. It never has been the church. It never will be the church because it's not built on the cornerstone, Christ Jesus. She's the mother of harlots and everything that comes. Is this going live? She's the mother of harlots and everything that came out of her in the Protestant Reformation. They are the little harlots. If you're not all right with that, go read that 17th chapter of Revelation. Every perverse thing, she's the, she's the nest of every foul bird. She's drunk with the blood of the martyr. Oh, I'm chasing rabbits. So the cornerstone determines, it validates, it informs, it shows parameters, and it determines ownership. What belongs to God is built on his cornerstone, is built on his foundation. It is as God said it must be, or it's some man's church, some group's church, but it's not God's church. Somebody say praise the Lord. It's, it's God's house. He said, now thou, thou art Peter, but upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God's church is built on his rock. God's church is built on his word. Anything that deviates from that is not God's church. And the good news, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. How many of you know that you are God's church? How many of you know that you are God's building? You're not too sure about that. You're kind of reluctant to even get engaged in that conversation. But I want you to know that that promise covers you today. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And if you're God's church, the gates of hell cannot prevail against you. It won't prevail against your prayer. It won't prevail against your family. It won't prevail against your worship. Somebody needs to dance on the devil's head for just a minute there. Give God a little bit of praise. He can't prevail. He can't prevail. He can't prevail. House of God is always built upon the biblical rock, and the gates of hell shall not. It cannot. Paul says this to the church at Corinth, and they're a ragtag mess out of that Hellenistic world that's swirling around them. They are such a mess. He's trying to teach them about monogamy and fidelity and no fornication. And they got temple uh, prostitution going on. You know, it's, a, it's such a strange idea. But he says, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Somebody say, my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And say, the Holy Ghost is in me. And I have it of God. And I'm not my own. For I've been bought with a price. Therefore, I'm going to glorify God in my body and in my spirit. Well, I don't know if it takes all that. It takes all that if you're going to glorify him in your body and in your spirit. It's not enough to just say, well, I'm worshiping God in my spirit. Get your body involved. God is a holistic experience. Love God with all your heart, mind, strength, body, soul, and spirit. So this foundational stone determines the horizontal nature of our experience. The, the, the natural, the theological, the cultural parameters. Horizontally. That's in world 
experience, world time, world connection. The house of God is limited. The house of God is exclusive. The house of God is restricted and restrictive. The house of God is specific. There are some things that the house of God will not house. Paul gives you lists. Paul gives you lists. He's writing to that wild-eyed crowd from Corinth. And he said, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? You can't be God's house. You can only be God's house if you hold fast. You can't be God's house if you're going to be involved in unrighteousness. Know you not that the unrighteousness, that unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. You can't be a fornicator. You can't be an idolater. You can't be an adulterer. You can't be a homosexual. You can't be an abuser of yourself with mankind. Now, I know there's churches that are having homosexual weddings, and there's churches that are teaching all kinds of things that are not like the Bible, but they're not God's church. They got off the stone somewhere. They're not built on the rock Christ Jesus. They'll tell you anything, and the culture tells you you ought to feel that way, and the culture says don't talk like that, and the culture says don't preach like that, but it's in the word of God and if we're going to build it we're going to build it by preaching and we're going to build it by prayer and we're going to build it on the cornerstone of the word of God you can't be a thief which means you got to pay your taxes and your tithes can't be covetous or drunk or a violent or an extortioner and you won't inherit the kingdom of God and such this is good news and such were some of you now you've been washed, you've been sanctified. Are you glad for that? Justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's church is exclusive. It's restrictive. It's specific in nature. You have to be born of the water and the spirit. You can't, you can't enter in. You can't even see it. You can write books and live a whole lifetime and stand behind a pulpit and talk about these things. But if you're not born of the water and the spirit, you're handling somebody else's mail. You're not even involved in it at all. Works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Right into the Galatians, the same list he wrote to the... This, is, this, is, this covers every uh, geographic locale. It covers every place along the timeline of history of the church. It's, uh, the church is not limited numerically. You can get as big as you can touch people. You can get as big as many people as you can pray through. You can make it. You can have a church bigger than anybody ever thought. You, you can fill up a soccer stadium somewhere or a football stadium somewhere. Now, that would be something to see church is not limited numerically it's not just we little blue few it's not just we little tight crowd here the church can be as big as the church can reach today and of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end you were designed to grow the church was designed to grow we're not limited physically you can build as big and as broad as you want to build. But it's limited by purpose and by design. You can't let in what God doesn't let in. you got to build it on God's foundational structure. Now, vertically, there's no limitation. It's just how limited you are in vision and in life and in time. And, and, uh, but there is no increase. So here you go. You are called as the house of God, as a part of the collective house of God, and, and, and you are called to build. Every one of us is called to build. The Word of God teaches us to build everyone around us, to be an edifier of everyone. Or Paul goes so far as to say, if it's not good for edifying, don't say it. If you can't say something good, shut up. If there are children here, explain to them why the bald-headed preacher said shut up. But there's some times you just need to shut up. So you're going to build three houses. You're going to build your personal house, which is your body bought with a price, filled with the Holy Ghost, that belongs to God, and you don't own it. You're the project manager. You're building it, but it doesn't belong to you because you came to an altar, and you said, please save me. And he said, okay, I will, but now I own you. And the day you don't want him to own you is the day you walk away from his kingdom. You're going to build your 
personal house, which is your body, your personal life, you're going to build your familial house, as Joshua was speaking about when he said, as for me and my house, or when God says, write it on the doorpost of your house, or when they're putting blood on the door of every house, there's, some, there's responsibility there for your house. So you're going to build you you're going to build your familial house, and you're going to build the corporate or collective house of God, which is the church collectively. You are the church individually. You are the church collectively. You have a mandate from the Word of God to build all three of these houses. The stone, the foundation, Ephesians 2. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, We are God's household and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That just simply means what they taught, we teach. What they loved, we love. What they cautioned against, we caution against. What they preach, we preach. Amen. You know, it's so crazy. I first heard the, I first heard the, uh, the witness of Acts 2.38 in the gospel. I was 20 years old. We were, we were uh, out of church. My wife was Presbyterian. I was raised Baptist. We came to apostolic truth because they were the only ones that consistently had biblical answers to our incessant questions. And uh, I went back to my old Baptist pastor, Brother Jimmy. I said, Brother Jimmy, can you help me here? Yes, I will, son. And, uh, and so he, I opened up the Bible and I said, can you reconcile Matthew 28, 19 and Acts chapter 2, verse 38? And he looked at me and he closed the Bible. And when he did, it went boom. Closed the Bible and said, I'll take Jesus' words over Peter's. And I said, that is remarkable. I sure appreciate your time. Thank you so very much. You have helped me immeasurably. Because I never went back there. Because he said, he said, Jesus is number one apostle against Jesus. He put the, the word of God at odds against the word of God. He's twisting and torturing it for the sake. You don't ever close the word of God. You may not understand the word of God, but you burr down. You get in prayer. You find the answer to what God has said. But you never close the word of God. And you take the word of God in context. And you take the word of God in synthesis. You never pull it out and tack it to the wall. All by itself. Somebody say praise the Lord. We're fellow citizens with the saints, the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. And he's not just building you and having you build yourself for just some decorative purpose, but he wants to live within you. He wants to take up habitation within you. He wants to dwell present tense right now with immediacy. He wants to dwell within you. You've, and he won't live in any old house. And he won't live in any old place. It's going to be his house. Founded on the cornerstone. Founded on the apostles and the prophets. It determines everything. So Isaiah talks about it. He says, therefore... Thus saith the Lord God, I, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, a perfect stone with perfect uh, edges and perfect measurements and per so perfect that you could run a line. He says, judgment will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. He said, I'm taking every horizontal measure off that perfect stone. I'm taking every vertical measure off that perfect stone. Horizontally, you can go as far as you want, Paul. You can go from Jerusalem up through Corinth and Ephesus. You can go around Asia Minor. You can go all the way to Rome, Paul, as long as your little string that you're pulling, as long as you can look back to Jerusalem and see that it's right nestles right up against that, that chief cornerstone and you're in good. You can go as far as you want horizontally. You can go as far as you want to go vertically, but it's got to match up with what God the old timers used to say, you better line up. I'll guarantee you they got that axiom from the word of God. Everything, judgment lines up. What is right? What is wrong? What is of value? What is beautiful? What is good? All determined by the stone that God has established in his kingdom 
Praise God. You can build as far as you want, as high as you like, as long as you are indicating the fine points of that chief cornerstone. Judgment and righteousness. Paul calls it the pillar and ground of truth. The word of God is the ground of being for the church. So, uh, I, I... Should I do this? Should I go here? Should I be involved in this? Should I embrace this? Well, it's so easy. Here's the line. There's the line. I always want to be on God's side of the line. This is the Lord's day. This is the Lord's doing. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in what God has done. Now, they may reject him over there, but this is the stone that the builders rejected, and I'm I'm standing on it. Hey, why are you standing on that stone that everybody... Let me tell you something today. I live in the city of Birmingham. There's a gigantic... Uh, what Whatever you call those things. Big old thing there where, where people go instead of going to church. They call it a church. But I don't know what it is. But I know there are apostolic churches that have come there to learn how to do church. And it takes me a minute and stun silence. Somebody has to wipe the drool off my chin. I'm, wait a minute, wait a minute. An apostolic church came to my town, didn't call any apostolic churches, came to this great big old non-denominational structure to find out how, and they go home, and they change their lights, and they, and they, all, they all get in the uniform with the jeans and the, and the little. And I guess they're trying to break away from traditional structures, but they've created their own little tradition there, and you can see them a mile off. I can see them in the airport. I know when they're coming. We were at we were at uh, we were at the little conference there in Springville, Alabama, at Ignite, and uh, and uh, Brother Miles Young was there, and his children were there, and his new daughter-in-law was there, Boston's wife, and she's walking into a coffee shop in Birmingham, Alabama, and she runs into a guy, and she says, "Is that you?" She calls him by name, and he is he is a grandson of of uh, a guy that when when I prayed through was one of the icons in the church and, and, and I watched that family and you know I have great respect and regard for all of these elders that were there when I, when I prayed through but now I'm seeing their, their children and their children are saying it's not on that stone anymore it's not over there anymore those old paths, those old ways they're not getting us where we want to go look at the big crowd that we have look at the big place that we have this must be right I want to tell you I have felt the power of God in a Nipah hut in the Philippines. I have stood on a mountaintop in a third world country with no church at all and felt the glory of God. But you can't get what God has unless you're on the foundation stone Christ Jesus and the word of God. Somebody give God a little bit of praise and magnify him. You do it, you keep doing it, there'll be a crowd. People are going to come because people are hungry. Their world has lost its mind. But don't you walk away from what God has made sure. He said, if you do it well, you do it right. Matthew 7, he said, you're wise. And you're like a man that builds a house on rock. And he said, the storm's going to come, the wind's going to blow, but that house is going to stand. Is there somebody in this place that can say, I've been through some storms, I've been through the flood, I've been through the fire, but I was standing on the word of God, and God was with me. I can't answer every question for every wounded, broken heart. I can't answer every cynic's bitter plea. But I can tell you this. I've been through the fire. I've been through the flood. And God has been faithful to me. Is there anybody in the house that can say God has been faithful? God has been faithful. The cornerstone determines legitimacy. The cornerstone determines ownership. It also endure, it, it, it informs us as to that house's capacity to endure. We're responsible for our personal house. I got to build my own house. Now I could get I could step off into some deep stuff here, but I'm just going to tell you, it'd be pitiful. For you ride on the coattails of the collective. 
and never turn your two talents into four or your five talents into ten. Hiding in the house of God, riding on the coattails of somebody else's prayer life and somebody else's word life and somebody else's worship. You're a freeloader. God is not a socialist. God is a capitalist. He's put some investment in you and he demands a return on that. You must build your house. Grow yourself. Learn to pray. Get yourself educated in the things of God. Find a ministry. Be of value to your pastor. Stand in the house of God and you may be small in your own eyes, poor in your own eyes. But if you come in the power of God, God can turn a sack lunch into something that feeds a multitude. It doesn't matter how much you have. It just matters that you use it for the kingdom of God. Build yourself. Educate yourself. Build yourself. And I'm going to touch something real fast and I'm going to get away from it. I am so devastated and so sad to see people spend the last 20 years of their ex apostolic earth experience and they cannot function because they have destroyed their physical vessel. Because they don't have temperance and they think the will of God is a box of donuts every day. My God, I'm, I've gone to meddling now. But you've got rich and powerful resource in your life and in your vessel. And here you are and you can't function and you can't worship and you can't go knock the door and you can't get down to pray anymore because you have ravaged your body with indolence and intemperance. That's not the will of God. You've got to build your body. Take care of your vessel. Some things are as bad as smoking. But we don't preach against that. We preach against smoking. But I'm telling you, if you destroy your body, you're not using what God. Okay. I'm going away now. We, hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy, and, and. It's going to be holistic. It's going to be body, soul, and spirit. I am responsible to God for my body. I'm responsible for, to God for my mind, what is in it and how I grow it. I'm responsible for what's in my spirit and how I keep it. I, gotta, I have to grow my natural vessel. And I'm responsible for that secondary house, which is my familial house. I'm a man. I am responsible to grow, build, edify my wife. She is not an appendage. She has a name. Her name is Donner. It's been that all her life. But in the church at large, she's Sister Sutton, which is a peculiarity. But she's a child of God with great ministry in her own right. I know that because she tells me. But I have a calling to build her. I have a calling to build my children and equip my children. I have a calling so that when I am gone, when my body is withered away in a grave somewhere, my children are still standing on the stone. You know what the Bible says about them? They are like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. I don't want to build some slip shot arrow that won't go a long way for God. The word of God said they will speak to the enemy in the gate. I don't want them to get to the gate and not know what to say. I have a calling to build my family. As for me and my house, I believe in the collective house. But I really believe this. And this is how we, this is how we schedule it at home. You do what you want and you do whatever your pastor teaches you today. But we draw concentric circles. There's a dot in the middle of the concentric circles. That is you. You're the dot in the middle. Everything is held together by the center. The next layer out is your wife. The next layer is your children. The next layer is your vocation. Because vocation is ministry. 
If you're a carpenter, you're an apostolic carpenter. If you're a pipe fitter, you're an apostolic pipe fitter. If you're an attorney, you're an apostolic first, and then you're an attorney. And by that, you go into places, you reach people, you stand in places that nobody else is able to go, and you build that. You build that vocational ministry. The next circle in our sequence, you do it like you want in your place, is the church. You say, well, my star, son, why do you put the church way out there that many circles away? Because the church is no stronger than that core individual. And the church won't be any stronger than that family and that marriage. And the church won't be any stronger than the strength of those children. And that is not the preacher's job. That is my job. That is not the, that's not an organization's job. That is my job. I've got a calling to build the house. And there's a template in heaven for what my house should look like. And I've got to build it according to the pattern shown on the mount. There is a perfect man. I'll never reach it, but I've got to build toward that. There is a perfect family. I'll never reach that, but I've got to build toward that. And then there's that collective, that corporate body. I've got to build that. I want to be faithful to the people of God. Let me just tell you right, this, right now, if all you do is sit around and talk about what's not right and what's not good and what's not strong and what the preacher didn't do or what the musicians didn't do, you pick them apart, you pick them apart, you talk about what they did and do my God why don't you just get on the wave of what they are doing per don't let perfect kill the good things that are going on every day all around you and don't make your wife feel like she's got to be perfect and don't make your babies think that you expect them to be perfect because you're not perfect somebody say praise the Lord I got a job to build I got a job. To, it's so easy to build, to talk about how good a job you did and how glad I am to see you. And we don't eat the preacher for lunch and dinner around the table. We build. We talk about the good. You say, well, how can you get better if you don't identify the problem? We'll identify the problems, but not every day, every breath we breathe, every meal we eat. You're an advocate for the devil. The devil can go to the Bahamas. He doesn't need to work on you. You're doing all the work him, for him. Undermining, tearing down. Build the house. Build the house. Build the house. Build your life. Build your family. Build your church family. Go to your pastor. What can I do? Pray to God. Get a ministry. Go knock a door. Go pray a prayer. Go, go build something in the house of God. Jacob made a big mistake. Jacob made a lot of mistakes. But one of the mistakes Jacob made was at Luz. Because at Luz, he has the vision of the stairway to heaven. And he wakes up and says, how dreadful and awesome is this place? This is the house of God. But that wasn't the house of God. God wasn't even there because Luz was there. God didn't come to Luz. God came to Jacob because that old man had put that gnarly hand on his head and prayed for him. Now, everywhere he went, the host of God went with him. The angels of God went with him. Do you know that you've been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost and the host of God encamps around about you? And everywhere you go, that angelic host is with you just like, just like they were with Jacob. But Jacob thought it was the physical place. He said, my word, I've stumbled upon the very gate of heaven, the door of the house of God. He renames the place Bethel, the house of God. And he goes on in his life and he's just as blind as, as he was when he walked in the door of the house. He said, I'll come back to this place. The only problem with a fixation on the place is that Monday you're not at the place. And Tuesday you're not at the place. But you're still the house of God. You are still the house of God. You dress just like you dress when you were in the house of God. You talk just like you talked when you were in the house of God. You behave just like you behaved when you were in the house of God. You don't change your culture nor your behavior or anything else. The quality with which you pursue the word of God on a Monday or a Thursday or a Friday. Because you are the temple. You are the house of God. You are the church of the living God. 
And there's this, if you find there's a disconnect between your Sunday life and your Tuesday life, it may be in the way you're thinking about it. Because your prayer should be just as robust. And you don't need to find yourself. If I can just make it back to church. You are the church, sweetheart. If I can just make it back and I, I can get another touch. You're living on somebody else's touch. You're living on somebody else's anointing. You're living on somebody. you got to get together with the collective. Friend of mine, you need to be able to stand on the rock and say, He's given me everything that I need. And I can touch God. The angels of God are ascending and descending at your house. The angels of God are ascending and descending at your job wherever you are they are there touch yourself and say this is the house of God praise God I gotta quit build up the house build up the house the, the psalmist says walk about Zion learn her bulwarks tell her towers you need to know what is the house of God so that you can effectively build up the house of God. If you're new to this, find an elder that's standing and strong and full of good things. Find one that's always positive and edifying about everybody and everything around them. And then get right up next to them in the prayer meeting. Get it right up next to them. Absorb what's on them. Let it, let it get all over you. Walk around. Learn what it looks like. The biblical, the apostolic church in the book of Acts. Find some of these elders that have built great works and go and find. I told I told Brother Wilson, if I lived out in this area, I told Brother Godair, if I lived in North Carolina, I'd be beating on your door and saying, how did you do this? If I lived in Little Rock, I'd be earning anywhere in Arkansas. I'd be knocking on Brother Holmes' door. I would be saying, how did you do this? And Brother Godair said, but they're not. And Brother, and Brother Wilson said, but they're not. They're not knocking on the door. I don't, it, it, it just it escapes me. It amazes me. But you need to tell the towers. Find out how to build the house of God. Praise God. Brother Kurt, come. Somebody come. Give them some hope. Give them some reason to believe. Everybody say build the church. By wisdom is a house built it. I got to quit because I think my church's favorite preacher is about to come and preach to you. Nobody in the world has a bigger heart than Larry Booker. Phenomenal, phenomenal, wonderful vessel in the kingdom of God. I want God in the house. I want him in my house. I want him in my familial house. My wife was home with a sick grandbaby the other night. And she's by herself. We're, we're out in the middle of the woods. And she's listening to church on the internet. And she felt something. She started feeling the presence of God. And that little six-year-old was sitting there doing artwork or something like that. Never looked up. Said, Grammy, somebody's here. Grammy, somebody just came in the house. I want God in my house, in my familial house. Don't misunderstand me. I love church. I love hanging around with you. I love conferences. I love being at church. I love what I feel in this house today and in all your houses that I visit. But I want to get up in the morning. And I want to feel. I don't want any less God in my house. I want a move of God in my house. And you say, well, well how do I get a move of God in my house? Well, how do you get it in the big house? How do you? Is church the only place you worship? Is church the only place you pray? You need to move God in your house. So Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. They're waving the palm fronds. 
They're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise ushers him down from the heights, down into the city, into the temple complex, and into the house. Praise always brings him into the house. I want him in the house. Because when he gets in the house, he cleans the house. Money changers one way. Those selling animals the other way. I need him to come into my house and cleanse my house. And I need him to do that on Tuesday. And I need him to do that on Thursday. And I don't need to wait until Wednesday or midweek or Sunday morning or a hot Sunday night service or the choir does it just right. I've got to have sense enough to get in to access the things of God myself. Build the house. Praise God. Let's stand together. I got to stop. Praise God. The world's in convulsion. The church world's in convulsion. People are leaving the solid stock rock of God. But there are people in this house today that have said, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground sinking sand we've got friends and family that are going other ways but we say on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand if you're thinking about it don't even think about it all other ground is sinking sand somebody that hasn't got a made-up mind yet you need to step out and you need to make up your mind today and say on christ the solid rock I stand. all other ground i'm gonna do it just like my pastor did it i'm gonna do it just like his daddy did it before him everything else is sinking sand all of the ground is sinking sand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. But only lean, but only lean, I'll only lean on Jesus' name. Solid rock, I stand all of the ground is seeking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Brother Sutton beat me to it. See, I was going to have someone usher my mama up here to this B3. But I don't want her to put Brother Kirk and Brother Richard to shame. Because we would be in that old church. We'd make peanut brittle till 1 o'clock in the morning.
Some of you don't know what peanut brittle is. You need to thank God you don't know what peanut brittle is. And my mama would pour that candy. We'd make a thousand bags a night. She'd mix that. And then she'd slip up Sarah and I don't know where Marsh is. I think they're on their way. And uh, they were little old bitty things. She'd slip up that back stairway up into the sanctuary and the people had left. And I knew where she was going so I would slide up behind her. Slip in there and she'd sit down on that B3. And my mama would pray and worship on that organ. And that's the way that she would break the stress and the relaxation. She would begin to play. She didn't just play, she worshiped. And I would sit there and she'd start playing my hope is built on nothing less than the Holy Ghost you can have your smoke you can have your disco balls you can have your lights I was sitting in a hospital room brother Cast sister Cast watching sister Laverne Cast, she passed away and she was trying desperately to live. And they had four drips on her. And they came in and they added another one. And the emergency doctor that was actually a trauma doctor came in and he said, Reverend, I've never seen a lady that wants to live so drastically. He said, I have never seen anybody with this many drips on that was still alive. And I looked at her and there were wires hooked up all over to her. There was all kinds of technology that was hooked up to her. Trying to keep her alive. And the Holy Ghost began to talk to me and said. You know churches that are dying. They're hooked up to all of this technology. They're, they're con- all of this technology is hooked up to them. And they're trying to stay alive. But, but a church that's built on the solid rock I'm not knocking technology we have it here today but I'm going to tell you something that's not what makes the church great it's what this man of God preached today I dare not trust you know it sing it the sweetest fame but only lean on Jesus name help me on Christ the solid rock I stand all of the ground is sinking sand all of the ground is sinking sand can we lift our hands and love him and thank you for this word Come on, let's praise Him. Let's praise Him right now. Let's praise Him. Let's praise Him. Let's praise Him. We got time. We're going to give Bishop Booker all the time he needs, but, but I think we need to spend a few minutes in the presence of the Lord right now. Come on, let's fill this house with a little worship, a little praise. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, I can't understand why people are going away. I love this message. I love this truth. I'm not having a problem with this. One God, Jesus name. Acts 2.38, holy living. You don't know where it brought me from. You should have seen what that message did in my life. Come on, let's praise Him. Let's thank Him. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God. Oh man, somebody clap your hands and praise you. <laughs> Woo! What a refreshing move of the Holy Ghost right now.